Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode 68 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. We are recording this on Monday, January 23rd, about 30 minutes or so after, after the conclusion of the NC State game. We will break down the win over Miami and the defeat against NC State. We will preview the games we have coming up this weekend, uh, first on Saturday against Wake Forest and next Monday against Notre Dame. First off, it's me, Donald. I am running things this week. Of course, we got the other two guys on board. We got Sam in Denver. What's up, Sam? Hey, Donald. How are you? I'm doing okay. And uh, we got Jason in Atlanta, home of the NFC champion Atlanta Falcons. Jason, how, how's, the, how's your Dirty Bird doing? Oh, uh, it's going quite well. Rise up, Falcon fans. Well, don't, pre- we'll talk about- don't, don't, don't pretend like you're like a Falcons fan. <laughs> I've lived I, in the I, city. I wait, 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 wait. I've lived in the city my entire life. Yeah. I have probably watched 98% of the Falcons games that I have that have happened in the past 40 years. Uh, wow. What do you mean I'm not a Falcons fan? I don't know. It's just that we've never talked about it. So, so it, I guess it's just never come up. Well, My that's, be- that's because this is the Duke basketball report, not the Falcons football report. Yeah, but everybody knows that like, Donald's <laughs> a fan of like, USA soccer, which is obviously not pertinent to the conversation here. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that, off topic. Off topic. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss the Super Bowl next week, most likely. Uh, but first, let's recap the games we had this past weekend and tonight. Uh, first, Duke back at home after two games the week before on the road. Uh, they come home last Saturday and they defeat Miami 70-58 to in what was really a tale of two very different halves. And, and like I said, 30 minutes before we started recording this podcast, uh, Duke loses to NC State 84-82 in what was an incredible struggle of a game. NC State earns its first win in Cameron since 1995. Also, that game uh, did not feature uh, Coach Mike Krzyzewski, uh, who was out with uh, back surgery back then as well. Uh, I will start with you, Sam. Uh, you can go ahead and break down the games one at a time uh, or your collective thoughts on the two games. So I think that we said last week that Duke really needed to go 2-0 and against Miami and NC State. And if you had asked me before those two games, you know, if they were going to go 1-1, one and one, what would be preferable? Well, you really got to beat NC State at home because they're bad. Um, and Duke failed to do that. Obviously, the first half against NC State went pretty well. We uh, I, I, Also, as we discussed last week, the question when you play NC State is what do you do about Dennis Smith? Do you let him have his, uh, you know, do you, do you just leave one man on him and, and, you know, let him do what he's going to do and let the other guys fail? Uh, or do you really try to collapse on Smith and, and wreak havoc? And do kind of seem like they chose to do neither tonight. Um, in the first half, it seemed, it seemed like it was going to be okay. They were going to be able to weather it, even though Smith was having a, a pretty good game and was able to get to the rim pretty easily. And we can talk, I think we can talk a lot about about Duke's interior defense, um, but then in the second half, it seemed like it seemed like the whole thing fell apart. And admittedly, I missed I missed the the first chunk of the second half, um, but I saw enough of what was going on later in the second half to know that um, there were breakdowns on both ends of the court. Uh, Duke was taking a lot of bad shots in the second half, and they they were playing defense lazily all over the place. But I think that specifically there were problems. Um, there were problems in the paint. NC State guys, not just Smith, um, but guys like Abu, um, guys who really shouldn't be the ones beating you, um, were getting balls down low and were getting easy shots um, and and didn't seem like they were especially playing out of their minds. You know, if you, like if you put different jerseys on these guys, I would have watched this game and said, well, you know, Smith is Smith is obviously an extraordinary talent, but the other guys are, are, are totally containable. And, and Duke has been pretty successful, I think, in recent years against NC State. So it was a it was a very surprising loss. Now I should say that against Miami in the second half, Duke looked really strong. Um, they got contributions uh, from Matt Jones, who played really well, um, and Marquise Bolden also looked really good. I think for his first time this season, looked really good against Miami again at both ends of the floor. Uh, he was able to finish a couple plays nicely. He made some good defensive plays, and and one of the questions I had towards the end of the game tonight against NC State was why isn't Marquis Bolden getting more opportunities to try to play defense inside? Because the formula that we were using wasn't working. Um, and towards the end of the game, NC State, they created separation and Duke got back into it. Um, but, but I, I, I'm really, I'm really concerned about both, about both the offense and the defense at this point, Jason, what do you want to <laughs> tell? Give me a direction to go here. 
Yeah, I, I, and I don't know the direction to go. Uh, Sam and I were talking before we came on the podcast just for a couple seconds, and I said, I'm really worried. And I'll, I'll be honest, for the first time all year, I'm really, really worried, and yeah, I can't I, put I, my finger on it. I think that, I, you know, the, the one thing you could say about, about being worried, and I share that concern with you, Jason, is that the team isn't really fully healthy yet, you know, Harry Giles, seem, Harry Giles still seems like he's getting his legs underneath of him, and obviously Coach K isn't running the show. That being said, those two limitations should not stop Duke from beating NC State in Cameron, right? No, and, and this game didn't follow the pattern of some of Duke's other losses recently, which, uh, look, if there was one thing that was, that was really affecting us, uh, when, when we played Florida State and Louisville earlier and lost both of those games, um, uh, that was a down week. That was a bad week. Uh, but both those games were on the road. And, and, and I think all of us, you know, the three of us, and I think all Duke fans identified and went, oh, it was, it was on the interior and it was depth. Um, uh, you know, we got killed on the boards, on the offensive boards and stuff. That's the reason we lost those games. Well, now we play NC State. They only had seven offensive rebounds. It's not like Stake was killing us on the board. We had three more rebounds than they did on the game. Um, and, and yes, uh, Abu and Capita. Uh, where'd this Ted Capita guy come from? Like, this guy freaking owned stretches of the game. Like, owned it. Um, he, had his, uh, he had his Bootsy game against us tonight. Yeah, this is a guy averaging four points a game. He puts up 14 points and 10 rebounds against us. On six um, or seven shooting. I mean, it, yeah, it, was, it yeah. was not a lazy effort. Uh, I, I was troubled. Uh, the thing that really has me concerned now is I, I, I think du offensively Duke is not playing smart. Um, we settled for a lot of three pointers in this game and we did not hit them. And, and it's weird because when you're at home, usually you hit those shots. I couldn't believe how many wide open. And I mean, look, NC state is, I said it in the preview. They're a terrible, defensive team they left us wide I, I i mean matt jones and grayson allen probably each took and jason tatum also probably each took at least two maybe three four or five really wide open like you're not on the move there isn't a guy with his hand in your face wide open three pointers that they missed um and 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 jason tatum uh, the guy he he is he makes some incredible moves. I, I can see why the NBA scouts are absolutely salivating um, at, at the prospect of getting him. It, it, uh, in the first half, he made a fadeaway spinning jump shot that was so NBA. I was like, oh my gosh, that is that is the way the best the best players in the NBA score. But it almost feels like he's trying too hard. Um, he 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 he's just a couple inches away from being able to do the things he wants to do. So. Uh, his finishes at the rim, I thought, were were very poor. He 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 would make an incredible move, but then the finishing part of it didn't happen for him. Um, and somehow the the box score says he had two turnovers. I swear, Jason Tatum lost the ball, you know, dribbling and driving at least three or four times. Uh, how could how did he only have two turnovers? In a uh, game where he shot fifty percent from the field, like could you imagine? Like in your mind, this is like the worst looking fifty percent from the field. Right, because there were yes. there were yes. bad shots, and there were, as you say, miss miss layups that are just like they're inexcusable. Um, uh, from a guy who and and Tatum's one of the guys that I, I really wanted to talk about here because, um, you know, I think in the case of Giles, like I said, it seems like he's still coming back from injury, um, and he's still limited. He's still wearing the brace, obviously. Tatum came back a little earlier than that. I don't think. Do we know what exactly what the details were of Tatum's injury? Maybe. But he's been back now for, for two months, and and he's playing and heavy minutes. He's playing heavy yeah, minutes. Playing yeah. heavy minutes. So he, he looks healthy. I mean, he's he's able to move, um, but doesn't really seem like he's in the flow with the rest of the team. On on offense, especially on defense, he you know he's fine, but he's not he's not outstanding. I, I don't know if there was. Well, a... I'll say I I do want to say this. Um, yeah. I think that Tatum and Bolden, the 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 def the difference I'm seeing in their defense this week versus a week ago when we were talking about the Louisville and FSU games, um, the, the difference in their defense, in their defense, in their ability to, um, to, to, to hedge and recover. Um, and, and Giles too, they're all doing a much, much better job of that part of the, of, of defense. 
Um, I, we're still not doing a great job of protecting the rim. I mean, we still gave up a tremendous number of points in the paint to NC State. Um, I mean, State, was, you know, they were it was balls, they were okay. It was, balls, it was balls being passed into the paint and also the drives. You know, it wasn't like yeah. it wasn't like the one aspect of the game that that they were shutting down. They were kind of just yeah, letting everything. You in. know what was weird to me was that I I felt like this was a game of ebbs and flows, and I felt like Duke would play really good defense for a little while, but both both Matt Jones and Frank Jackson took turn Smith Jr. And I thought they both played pretty well. Um, he's just sort of borderline unstoppable. But uh, I, I, there were times where I thought Duke was playing really good defense. And then, like, suddenly uh, Capito would get three offensive rebounds or, or you know, uh, would, would just finish with easy slams. And, and you go, oh, wait, hey, this game that, that felt like we were about to, you know, sort of run them out of the building, suddenly it's back down to a four-point lead. And, and then at the very end, they, I, I, I'll tell you, when Dennis Smith pulled up for, they were down one point, I think it was 70-69, Dennis Smith pulls up for a three-pointer, and I, it was in the air. And I said to myself, I said, that's going in, and we're going to lose this ball game Because I knew Dennis Smith was going to take over at that point. And that's, that's a lot of what happened in the final two and a half minutes or so. Hey, um, Donald, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. Two stats, two simple stats from, from this NC State game. Tell me which one of these is more concerning to you. Uh, Duke shot 28.6%. It was 8 for 28 from three-point range. And they shot 14 for 21, which is good for 67%. From uh, from the free throw line, which of those is more concerning? Uh, for me, it's actually the three pointers because when you hit those, that changes momentum. And I think we had a lot of opportunities, like you guys said, we had a lot of opportunities where we had like very open looks, and I'm talking nobody within 10, 15 feet of the guy shooting the basketball. Uh, and we had like, like we had like eight point we had like seven to five, seven, eight point leads at the time. It was the kind of it was the kind of moment where a a big three, you know, could have really gotten NC State down. And and we missed every single one of them this game. Right. And it seemed like in the second half, especially because in the first half, yeah, I thought it was very tough back and forth. But somehow we were still kind of building a lead slowly but surely. We were making baskets. We were getting to the line. We actually were making some free throws in the first half. Uh, I think in the second half, the, the wheels just fell off. Like I, I, I don't know what the percentage was in the second half, but I think it was, I, I, I recall at least six or seven open three-pointers that we missed in the second half that would have, like you said, created a momentum changer that would have given us like a seven-point lead, but with all the momentum in the world and basically NC State staring at an uphill hill or uphill battle to get back into the game. Um, I actually wanted to go back to the Miami game because um, I was at that game. And I, I wanted yeah, to talk. Right. We, skipped, we skipped the fact that Donald was at one of the games this week. <laughs> yeah. And it, it happened to be the good one. So, um, so I was at that game, and I thought in the first half of that game was our worst offensive output of the, of the year. I thought it was our worst output total. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, we didn't hit a single three-pointer in the first half. We didn't hit a single three-pointer. We didn't have a single assist. We shot 28%. We, we were letting in easy baskets. Um, everything that we talked about with Miami with them uh, crashing the boards and, and, and go driving and penetrating to the rim and getting buckets around the basket, they were doing that at will, it seemed. And I want to talk about that the first maybe seven to eight minutes of the second half of that game because we started out, I mean, they made their first, first basket of the half and then we went on a 20 to zero run. And I think that right there was the best basketball that I've seen Duke play in a long time. And I well, don't, and, 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 and what I, matters re- really quick, and, and you can continue, but what matters is we did it without, you know, without Giles, Allen, and Kennard. We went Bolden, Jones, Jackson, Jefferson, Tatum. And, uh, and I, look, I was going to lead to the point where that was the lineup that we started with uh, in this game. And we started this game with that line. Yeah. And, and, and they, they performed fairly well, I thought. Yeah. And, and I think, but I, I think. When I was at the game, I was telling my friend, we should just bottle up that first 10 minutes and save it for March. Bottle up the second, the last 10 minutes of the game and bring that out every game. Because I thought that over the rest of the second half, we still played very, very well. But that 10-minute stretch of basketball was some of the best basketball I've seen Duke play in a long time. It was, it was you know, balls-to-the-wall defense. It was, the, it was the type of stuff that reminded me of when I was in school in 2001 where the defense was so enthusiastic they were so happy about being on defense and being and playing well on defense that it made everything else seem easy to them 
Um, and we slowly, I mean, we went from a 10 point deficit to a 10 point lead in about seven minutes. And that was it. Like Miami couldn't handle us anymore. Um, I don't think they scored their 11th point of the half until about three minutes left in the game. So I think well, and it was, it was all Matt Jones too. I mean, like uh, Matt Jones, a, a guy who has been maligned by many, many Duke fans, a lot of folks who think, you know, he's not all that useful, not all that valuable. Oh, he only plays defense, stuff like that. Um, like defense isn't important. Uh, Matt Jones absolutely willed Duke to victory in a way. I'm not sure anyone else in the team has all year. He took over. He just simply took over. He, I mean, from the three pointers to the defense, he took over that ball game. But I think what, well, what... he did the uh, and, and he did the uh, Jason Williams miracle minute move where he stole the inbound and hit the quick three, which is and that like, was the first yeah, three, my very favorite plays. That was the first three we had hit of the game too, and it was a terrible three. It went in terribly, and even at that point, people were like, okay, we got the three, and that was the momentum that we needed. After that, he hit two more. Uh, Luke, uh, I'm sorry, Frank Jackson hit a, hit a, a baseline runner, and then he hit a layup um, to take the lead, and that was it. Like, the floodgates were open, but it was that defense and then the three-point that gave us the momentum that led to that victory. In this game, I feel like we just didn't have that in the second half. Every time we had a chance well, to well, have momentum... Well, we hang on. So, so there was a moment in this second half where, uh, where Matt Jones makes a steal, goes down, and feeds... Um, uh, Frank Jackson, he throws a lob that Frank Jackson slams through. Mm -hmm. And I want to say Duke took about a, a, an eight point lead at that point. Uh, I want to say there was around 11 minutes left, something like that. And I would have, uh, you could have made a lot of money from me. I would have wagered a tremendous amount of money that Duke was about to win the game going away, that that was, you know, it, it had the same feel that, that it did when, when uncle Maddie was stealing the ball and making three pointers against Miami. And I was like, oh, it's the same thing happening all over again. And then it just stopped. Um, I think, that, you know, Capita went on a, you know, scored a couple buckets in a row and, and Abu as well. And, and suddenly it was like a two-point game again. I was like, oh, man, you know, this dogfight will not stop. Um, yeah. And props, props to NC State. A NC State, I've seen a couple of their games. They haven't played this hard all year. I mean, if I was a State fan, you know, you're obviously thrilled and you're dancing tonight and you're you know you're like hey our, our team is finally here but how pissed are you at some of the games you've lost earlier in the season where you didn't put in one third as much effort as you did in this game i i mean it just goes to show you that this season so far has not made sense for a lot of programs like ourselves our, our team included uh you know if you're looking at right now i mean i'll ask you this question guys do you think you know obviously we have a game saturday but do you think we're at at risk of falling out of the top 25 just based on this game because yeah, I absolutely. think we are. You can't, lose, you can't lose at home to one of the worst teams in your conference and expect to be ranked. Right. I, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned home loss. The ACC is a bear this year. So difficult. Duke just lost a game at home. Where, are we going to get many road wins? No, we have, and we have tough ones left. I mean, they, they kept mentioning it on the broadcast how Duke still has to play at Notre Dame. We'll talk about that. Duke still has to play at. UNC, we'll talk about that here, what, in a, in a week or two. Um, Duke's, Duke's got hard games left on the schedule. And it's not that we're not talented enough to win those games. We are, but uh, road wins are really, really, really hard to come by. And We haven't, I, we haven't won one yet, right? Uh, if, if, yeah, if you had to ask me right now, oh, let me ask you guys. Okay, I'll, I'll put in my guess first. Then, uh, Based on what we've seen so far, Duke's currently three and four in the ACC, right? Mm -hmm. Based on what we've seen so far, what do you think our record's going to be? 11 and 7, 10 and 8? I mean, am I crazy uh, to say our record? I think 10, 10 and 8. 10 and 8 um, sounds realistic. I mean, Duke's, yeah, I, I missed. So the away games that Duke has left, Duke still has to play at Wake Forest and, and Notre Dame. Those are this weekend, and we'll, we'll be talking about those here soon. They're playing at Virginia, which <laughs> will be hard. They got to play at Syracuse, who hasn't been that great. They got to play at Miami, um, which is not an especially hard place to play traditionally. Um, and Duke has already beaten them on the home floor, and then a game against UNC. So, um, and as far as the home slate goes, we still get home games against North Carolina and Florida State to to highlight, you know, the the best teams. Wake and Clemson are both coming, in, and Pitt are all coming as well. Um, those are all teams that are vying for tournament bids or are in the case of wake and we'll talk about that soon is that they're they're probably in the tournament even though they're they're a pretty weird team um 
So, I mean, the, the schedule is hard. You know, the, the worst team that Duke has left is probably Syracuse. And, you know, it's not. They're not that, that bad. on the road. So, Look, we can't, you cannot, um, there is no one out there right now that can tell me they have the ACC figured out, even, even a little tiny bit. Clemson is one and six in the ACC. Clemson is one and six. I've seen Clemson play. That is a good team. That is a team that is absolutely good enough to make the NCAA tournament. I don't think they're going to because they're currently one and six, and I don't know how they get to 500. I'm not even sure how they get to like even a you know a game or two under 500 in the ACC with a one and six start. That is a really good team that is one and six in this murderous, super difficult league. Um, uh, the fact that Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, Boston College have combined for eight wins uh, is, has thrown everyone for a loop. Um, but, but you know, I'm getting way ahead of myself. This is just a, a really, really, really difficult league. A win's going to be hard to come by. Um, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really concerned. Before we get to the uh, previews, um, Donald, I, I wanted to go back to your experience being at the game and, and also ask you, Jason, as to what you perceived. Could you guys tell that, that I, I think, um, from watching on TV, that the games in Cameron this weekend were – particularly rowdy and that the and the crowd was really into it um donald was that the impression you got from being there yeah absolutely um i was actually going to talk about that a little bit later uh during our parting thoughts but uh i i think that why don't you you save it for them then yeah well i'll just i'll just say this to answer your question yes it was raucous it was loud it was crazy and especially in that point when we went on that long run against miami uh i've there are very few times where i've heard cameron louder So let's go ahead and uh, uh, preview the games that we have coming up this weekend. First, on Saturday, Duke will head to Winston-Salem to take on Wake Forest. Uh, Sam has looked at the game film for the Demon Deacons. So, Sam, why don't you tell us what we can expect from this game? Sure. So um, Wake Forest is a weird team. Danny Manning's squad is, um, is 13th in, in offensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm, and they're 124th in defense. Um, and their, their overall Ken Palm ranking is 35. So they are – they're definitely on the uh, on the right side of the bubble. They're probably getting into the tournament. Um, you know, something like Lenardi has seven, eight. Lenardi currently currently has them as a ten seed. As a ten seed, and and they could yeah. certainly improve upon that um, because because they're a pretty young team. Their their top uh, their top three scorers are all sophomores. So uh, Danny Manning's finally getting getting his guys into the program. This is his third year at Wake Forest, and and it it has been uh, pretty tough for him going so far. So his uh, his first season there, he went um, 13 and 19. The second season, he went 11 and 19. And this year, they're 10 and 7. So um, definitely improving under Manning. And, and so the guys who are leading the team, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of them real quick. Um, the, uh, le- their leading scorer is also their leading rebounder, John Collins. He's the man in the middle. Um, he's averaging almost 17 points and nine rebounds a game. So he's going to be a load to handle. Uh, expect, I guess, Emil Jefferson to be defending him, although – you know, who knows the way that the way that Duke is playing defense these days, exactly how how they attack a team where they're whose best whose best player is probably an interior player. And then um, their point guard is Bryant Crawford, also a sophomore, and he's averaging almost six assists a game. So he's he's right. He's not quite at Dennis Smith's level, um, but he gets the ball around and he also averages almost 15 points a game. So um, returning guys that we that we're familiar with, uh, I think the most important one is Konstantinos Mitiglou. Once again, Konstantinos Mitiglou from Greece. Uh, 6'10 junior, we know that he can he can shoot it from outside, even though he's a big guy. So um, so Wake Forest wants to move the ball around on you, um, but they uh, <laughs> the defense is poor. So um, points given up in conference. The, the, these are the points allowed uh, against Wake Forest in conference games. 88, 79, 93, 79, 66 high point, 73, and 88. So uh, exp- I would expect a high-scoring game. Um, and I'll be curious to see if Duke is able to lock up a team that has four double-digit scorers. Um, like I said, the best of whom is John Collins, who who does most of his damage from inside. Um, you know, they're a they're a good scoring team. They spread the ball around. A lot of different guys get shots for them. Um, and uh, so, I, and, and the game is also at Wake Forest in Winston Salem, uh, a place that you know is not the most intimidating ACC arena, but it is an ACC arena and. You can bet that the Wake Forest fans would love to take another bite out of this Duke team that has not obviously been performing well recently. Um, I I think Duke can still win this game. Um, I I think I expect them to win this game 
Wake Forest has, has been, like I said, they've been better than, than usual. They still have a lot of losses in conference. Um, and they were, uh, they were Clemson's only win, um, in conference. So, uh, other than that though, only losses to good teams, UNC, UVA, FSU, um, and then in the non-conference Xavier, Villanova and, uh, and Northwestern. So, um, so no bad teams that they've lost to. It's certainly not the Wake Forest that we've seen in the last few years, um, but still improving. And, uh, and and so we'll see we'll see how Duke does against them. Have either of you guys uh, gotten the opportunity to watch Wake Forest at all? Well, I'll tell you one thing I know about Wake Forest. You didn't mention they have probably the best guard not named Chris Paul <laughs> to play for Wake Forest. His son is on the team, Brandon Childress, the son of Randolph Childress. Plays for Wake Forest, uh, and, yeah. And as a freshman, he's, he actually, he's on the team. <laughs> yeah, no, as a freshman, he plays about twenty minutes a game. He, he's doing pretty nicely for them. Um, and God, do I have memories of his father killing Duke? Oh man, his dad was a stone cold assassin. Oh, he, was, he was on those teams with Tim Duncan that just wrecked us, right? Yeah, yeah. And Rodney Rogers. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't so much Tim Duncan. He was with Rodney Rogers. Oh, right. okay. Um, and uh, yeah, Brandon Childress. Uh, he would put up 30 against Duke all the time. Randolph. Ran- yes, Randolph. I'm sorry. Brandon being the son. Yeah. But, he's, uh, on the, he's on the coaching staff now, maybe? Or he was on the coaching staff, or he's coaching somewhere else? I don't know. Yeah, something like that. You know, he never had the NBA career that I thought he would. Um, but yeah, he's in co- he may be on their staff. I'm, I am not even sure. He's currently an assistant coach for his alma mater. Thank you, Wikipedia. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the, the thing I was going to say about Wake is... Um, John Collins is a tremendously intriguing player. Um, he is a real athletic specimen. I think the NBA is uh, is eager to have this guy move on up to their level. Um, but he, you know, there are a lot of he, he's he's one of these guys who will make five or six plays in a row where you'll just go, "Wow, he is unbelievable!" And then he'll make five or six plays in a row where you'll go, "He has no head on his shoulders. He is prone to making some really, really." foolish stupid kind of plays and stuff and i think he picks up a lot of fouls um uh but he's he is capable of taking over the game he is really capable of taking over the game and he is he is only a sophomore i mean i i I don't know exactly what his recruiting story is but he's a sophomore playing for danny manning at wake forest he probably wasn't a very top recruit so the expectation for big guys um who aren't you know, at the, at the very top of the game is that they take a little more time to develop. And like we said, he's only a sophomore. So um, certainly a lot of room for him to improve. Even I, I don't know if he's leaving this year, um, but he has a lot of time to still, to still grow into that, into that body and to, and to get rid of all those mental mistakes. Yeah. Most folks expect him to be a late first round draft pick, but you are right about him not being a highly sought after recruit. He was, he wasn't a top 100 recruit. He was sort of, you know, a top 150 kind of, kind of recruit coming out of high school, and uh, he is someone who has blossomed. Um, and uh, you know, if he goes in the NBA draft in the first round, that'll be the kind of thing that Danny Manning will be able to to use as a recruiting hook. Um, you know, look, I took this guy who wasn't even that highly rated. Um, and he played for me for two years, and and now he's, uh, you know, making NBA first round money. Um, he was, and, and he was in the rotation last year. He played 14 minutes a game, but he certainly wasn't, you know, one of the keys to a team that wasn't that good. So it's not like we were expecting him to, uh, to, to break out this year in the way that he has. Yeah, I think there's going to be a, a good game. I think the one thing that I'm looking for is intensity. We're going on the road again. We haven't won on the road. And I think this is the kind of game that uh, energy is really going to be key uh, for our team, especially on the defensive end. Uh, I think that will help spur us. And especially after a week, uh, we basically have five days off. Um, we, we need that rest, and we also need to come together and regroup. Um, we thought we had done that, I guess, in the second half against Miami. Now we have five days to kind of think about what we need to do against Wake Forest and Notre Dame for these back-to-back sets. Because, uh, again, these games are – go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the, the schedule, you know, we talked about last week how we have this weird Saturday-Monday, like, Pac-12-looking thing going on right now in our schedule. Um, you know, on the one hand, it affords us more time off. On the other hand, it may also be helpful because it, it prepares you for tournament time. And we know how much coach K likes to simulate tournament conditions in the season. Um, so I'm sure that he is, he is treating these, you know, the, the, the back-to-back that we just had against Miami and NC state. And then this week against Wake Forest and Notre Dame, treating those as if they were tournament pods. 
um, so that the guys know that like, hey, we're preparing for a couple different teams all at once. Um, the turnaround is quick. We got to be focused, and uh, and and we'll see if if that preparation goes better this week. Although this week's test is admittedly a lot harder than last week's test. You took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly what I was about to say. But uh, see, <laughs> same wavelength, man. Weird. Mine. weird. Um, um, what do they say about geniuses that they're not us? Basically. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> After we head to Wake Forest, we hit the road again uh, next Monday. We head to South Bend to take on a Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult place for us to play. Uh, since Notre Dame has joined the ACC, uh, I don't think we have won there. Uh, so we are looking for our first win in South Bend since they joined the conference. Uh, Jason has been the resident expert on Notre Dame all season, and he's going to give us the inside scoop on what to expect. But Jason, before you start, I have one question for you. And that question is, did you find any evidence that Bonzi Colston has actually graduated so that he will be ineligible to play? Because I think at this point, he's been playing college basketball for about 27 years. Uh, do you know that Bonzi Colston is only a junior? That's like insane that's that he's only that's a junior. Because I, That's just obviously not true. He's been, he's been in college yeah, well, since 1984. Uh, it may feel that way, but Bonzi Colston is only a junior. Uh, um, Donald, you're, you're, you're right. I've been following this Notre Dame team all year. Uh, they are a ton of fun to watch because they are about as efficient an offensive team as you'll find. Ken Palm has them, has them as the number six offensive team in terms of efficiency. I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen, I, I, I don't know how they're only number six because they they hit free throws at a ridiculously high rate. They're at 83% on their free throws. They hit three-pointers at a ridiculously high rate. They're at 41% on their three-pointers. And by the way, they love to take three-pointers, and they have like uh, – th there are seven different guys on this team who have hit 10 or more three-pointers. Basically, at any given moment, there are five guys on the floor who are capable of, of draining a three in your face. Um, and And – I don't know how you decide who you're going to stop because they've got four different guys that average more than 14 points a game. Um, they're, they're just incredibly efficient. Uh, they pass the ball really well. You know, one of the a, a, a stat that I sometimes look at is um, is tempo um, because you want to see is a team pushing the tempo a lot? Are they really playing at a fast pace or are they patient? And Notre Dame plays very very patient. Their tempo rating is is uh, uh, is is low. Um, because they don't push the pace a lot. They take the time to find the right shot, and they're a very, very good passing team. They average more than 17 assists a game, which is a big, big number. Um, this is going to be a tremendously difficult chore for our uh, for our defense, um, and we've struggled on defense uh, mightily at times this year. I, I, I'm terrified that this Notre Dame team is going to sort of, you know, I don't want to say score with ease, but score with efficiency against us again and again and again. There are four guys for Notre Dame that play basically pretty close to the whole game. Bonzi Colson, we already mentioned, Steve Vesturia, VJ Beecham, and Matt Farrell. Those four guys are on the floor more than 30 minutes a game. And then they've got they got really three, four other guys who, who play, you know, between 8 and 15 minutes, that kind of thing. Um uh, Notre Dame, I'll tell you, tell you one place where they are a little bit vulnerable. They are not a big team, and they're not a great rebounding team. Um, Bonzi Colson, who is their big man, who somehow averages 10.9 rebounds per game, almost 11 rebounds per game. Um, Bonzi Colson stands six foot five. That's right. Their center is six foot five. Now he has the wingspan of a seven footer. I mean, his arms basically has to, you know, curl up his fingers so his knuckles don't drag on the floor when he walks. The guy is incredibly long armed, but um, but he is only six foot five, and they don't really have anyone over six foot eight who plays all that much. Duke has a lot of size. If our big men start to really get it, it could be a real problem for Notre Dame. Um, uh, and and that's a place where I think you know we could hopefully succeed a little bit against them. They're not a great defensive team. Now, they're not one of these teams. They're not NC State, where they just try to outscore you. But they're not a great defensive team. Um, uh, they're, they're only 62 in, in defensive efficiency, according to Ken Pomeroy. But it's worth noting that in the past, and uh, sorry, in the past, Notre Dame has been worse than that on defense. So though they aren't great, they are much better than they have been in, um, in past years. Uh, this, this Notre Dame team, I think is going to be a real, real tough task for Duke. 
um, a, a win against them would be would be huge. This is one of the best teams in the in the ACC right now, one of the best teams in the country, uh, and and I think that um, they're currently tied for first in the ACC um, at six and one alongside Florida State. Uh, and and the last thing to note about Notre Dame is there, there is not a single game on their schedule where you look at it and you go, wow, they, they didn't play very well in that one. Um, uh, they, they're three losses. They only have three losses on the season. Their three losses are to, to Villanova, who's probably the best team in the country, and they only lost by eight. And it was a game that was even closer than that. They lost to Purdue, uh, who's probably top two or three team in the Big Ten, um, only lost that game by five. And they lost at Florida State by three in a game, again, that was very, very close. There isn't a single game they have on their record where you go, oh, wow, they didn't play very well in that one. Um, this is a team that has beaten Louisville. Uh, they they won at Virginia Tech. They've won at Miami. We talked about how hard it is to get road wins in the ACC. They also won at Pittsburgh. They have three road wins already. Um, God, I, I, last week I told you that I didn't think Duke would lose to NC State, and I was wrong. wrong. Duke's going to beat Notre Dame, and I hope I'm wrong. I I I'm I, I the good thing about playing Notre Dame at this point is that you know. The last few years, this team has, has struggled against Notre Dame. I think that the stat I saw the other day was that Notre Dame's won like five of six against Duke since they joined the conference. It's something, something in that. Range. Yeah, they they have uh, been a Duke kill. They have been a Duke killer. They've taken us out a lot. And, and maybe it just goes to prove Mike Krzyzewski's, uh instincts that he never wants to play his old assistants because because they know how to frustrate him. Apparently, because Mike Bray's had more success against Coach K in three years than than anybody. Um, so you know that this team is not going to. Is, is not is not going to underestimate uh, Notre Dame certainly, and their best player is Bonzi Colson, who has been a total Duke killer. He's been at the you know at the the head of the pack against them. Um, so you know the 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 thing that maybe you take solace in is that as you point out, Jason, they're not especially deep. They really rely on four guys who play the bulk of the minutes. So um, maybe look for Duke to to try to initiate a lot of contact. Maybe get some of those guys out of the game. Um, what I'm curious to see is if Duke chooses to match up against them and only play one big most of the game. Um, you know, if it be a Jefferson or Bolden or, um, you know, or Giles, or do they, do they leave multiple bigs out there and let Jason Tatum, you know, play the three a little bit, um, try to try to be bigger than, than Notre Dame. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see which, which tack Jeff Cable takes in that regard, because, you know, against, against NC state, it seemed like, playing the size matchup didn't work for Duke. So maybe they take it in the opposite direction in, in this game. I just want to say, I, the one thing I want to say about Notre Dame is that they're like physically tough on all ends of the, of the floor. Like I, I think that they're a very sound basketball team that plays very smart, but they play tough with the basketball. Uh, the couple games that I've seen them play, they pull away from teams because of their tenacious defense and because they know how to protect the basketball. And when you have a team that uh, knows how to protect the basketball, they're hard out. And we learned that last year uh, with this team. And, and like you guys said, a lot of the, the key players are, are still on this team. So they play smart. They play physical. They, they're just very sound with the basketball. And I think that is going to be a really big test for this Duke team uh, that has shown at times to be kind of erratic um, on offense and defense. These guys are going to make, make them play their best game. And if we want to beat Notre Dame, we have to play our best game of the season on Monday night. So, so now we'll get into players of the week. I will start with you, Sam. Give me your player of the week. Um, just because it's, like I mentioned before, because it seemed like he had his best game of the season so far against Miami, I'm going to take Marquise Bolden. Although I assume that you guys, unless you're going to be cheeky and clever like I am, you're going to take Matt Jones, right, Jason? Yeah, I'm taking Matt Jones. Uh, no question about it. He was uh, the, the the 10 minutes of the second half, the first 10 minutes of the second half against Miami um, was probably the most complete performance we've seen by any Duke player this year in terms of by complete, I mean, offense and defense. Um, uh, Matt Jones was was truly outstanding. Um, and willed us to the victory against Miami. And, and I thought he played really nicely against NC State. Um, he did the best he could 
guarding uh, guarding Dennis Smith Jr. I'm not sure there's anyone in college basketball who can stop that guy. Um, and Matt Jones, you know, did all right. It he he missed he missed some open threes this game. There's uh, you know against NC State. There's no question about that. But uh, but Matt Jones uh, quite deservedly earns my player of the week. And I'm also going to go with Matt Jones. Uh, like you said, he was the spark in that second half against Miami. Um, he helped us. He helped us keep get energized. And I think the one thing that we didn't have in the first half against Miami, and a lot of the time in the second half against NC State, was energy. And I think Matt Jones provided that uh, at an important stretch of the game. So for that, I will also give him uh, my player of the week. You know, let me add one more thing about Matt Jones. Um, when uh, I-, I talked earlier about the moment where Matt Jones got the steal. Dennis Smith actually made a, a, a poor pass to the wing. Matt Jones got the steal, brought it up and threw the lob to uh, uh, to Frank Jackson. Um, at, at that moment, uh, in addition to thinking that Duke was about to run away from NC State, Matt Jones has, has uh, you know, over the course of the past two games, has saved Duke's season. Um, and and I, I said at that moment, I said, there's no question this guy is the player of the week. Um, because I really thought he had saved our season both against Miami and then bringing energy against NC State uh, uh, again. Um, I'm not so sure our season has been saved yet, <laughs> but uh, but Matt Jones has done his best to try to save it. And now we will get to parting shots. Uh, I will kick it to Jason to start it off. Uh, so I don't really have any big parting shot because I spent the weekend in Las Vegas having a ton of fun celebrating my 50th birthday with my brother, my brother-in-law, and a few other folks. Yes. Yeah, having way too much fun, eating too much steak, going to too many shows, and gambling way too much. So I don't really have a parting shot except to say this. Um, when I went to put my wager on the Duke Blue Devils to win the national title, believe it or not, the odds were still the same as they were in the preseason. The Got betters, it's nine to two, nine to two, uh, you know, a yeah. little more than four to one, um, wow. which is where that's pretty bad in the preseason <laughs> before anyone had been injured, before anyone had played a single game, before Duke had started struggling. And that's really interesting to me because I'm going to tell you a little hint about Las Vegas and the gambling community and the guys who set the lines and things like that. They're really, really smart when it comes to basketball. Um, when it comes to all sports, they know what they're doing. And they still think that Duke is the team to beat. Now, Kentucky is also 9-2. to two. Um, So at, the, at least at the sports book I was at, at the Paris C- Hotel Casino, which is, which is also part of Caesars and, and the entire Harris sports book world. So it's a pretty big realm. So those folks say that Duke and Kentucky are still the two teams to beat in college basketball. Now, part of that may be that people love to bet on Duke and Kentucky. Remember that these guys are trying to get enough money on different teams that they make, you know, that it all balances out and they get to collect their VIG and they, they win their big money that way. That's how the casino sports gambling works a little bit. But I, I was very intrigued at that. I thought that I was going to show up and Duke was going to be 10 or 15 to 1. I wouldn't have been shocked. And I was going to gleefully put down 100 bucks or something like that. And I looked at 9 to 2 and I went, 9 to 2? <laughs> And I didn't make a bet. That's my parting shot. What did you bet on, Jason? I bet on the Falcons. By the way, my, my brother-in-law, so shout out to Greg Kaplan, who's never listened to this podcast and probably no one even knows him. But Greg, my brother-in-law, played a four-way parlay on Sunday. He bet the Falcons, he bet the Patriots, and he bet the over in both games. Greg won 1000 bucks. So. Pretty good. <laughs> that's not bad that's not I, bad I, you play the game yep there you go all right sam your party shot um just because i've seen it mentioned in a few other realms of national college basketball discussion recently um and because we keep track of it in a in its own thread on the forum uh everybody watch out this is the year that northwestern is going to finally make the tournament um and i hope i'm not jinxing them but they are uh, they're having a spectacular season And uh, so everybody should, you know, in the midst of of all the craziness that's going on with with Duke, um, we should at least appreciate former Blue Devil Chris Collins squad up in Evanston. Uh, Friend of the podcast. Friend of the podcast. That's right. And and friend of the podcast. Um, So all it took was an appearance here, you know, last year for him to to get things going to uh, hopefully make the tournament this year. People don't realize what a miracle this would be. 
They and just don't. So, no, I think I actually they think, that, realize I think people do now. I, I, I think people do realize it. I think we just we we've conditioned ourselves to just not talk about it because they always find ways to to disappoint down the stretch, especially you know under the last regime under Bill Bill Carmody. It was like you know they could. I think there was one year they like won nineteen or twenty games. And it was like yeah, they, they just didn't do enough. I think at this point, like you know, they were talking about this on College Game Day on Saturday. They basically said that you know, assuming they this team makes the tournament, you have your runaway coach of the year in Chris Collins. Yeah, although although uh, Mark Few's done a pretty fantastic job with Gonzaga, and if they go undefeated, that's going to be no, a hard, no, a hard excuse story me, design. no, no, excuse me, no, no. <laughs> uh-uh. Uh-uh. Uh, so you could talk about Steve Alford. Um, yep. uh, 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 you know, for what he's doing at UCLA, there, there are some other great jobs. I forget who's co- is, is Scott Drew still coaching Baylor? Yep. Scott Drew's done a, done, done a pretty impressive job at Baylor. Yeah. And, and none of his guys have gone to jail yet and no one's murdered anyone. So that's an accomplishment at Baylor. Yeah. Which is a huge, a huge, and, and there's been no sexual assault to my knowledge. Yeah. 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 I don't know if any of them are going to class. Probably not. But I mean, the fact that no one's in jail is like a really successful season for Baylor. But no, no, seriously, there are other guys who've had who've done great jobs. If you give this to Mark Few, uh, you cannot give Coach of the Year to Mark Few. He doesn't play beat- anyone. He doesn't play. I don't care. They don't play anyone. They beat Arizona. They don't play anyone. They you can't Arizona. say. Arizona's you can't really say, good. You can't say one, two, three or so games against good teams, decent teams is the same as playing in a Power 5 conference I, I, where... I, 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 I'll agree with you as long as John Calipari also never gets to win Coach of the Year. Because the SEC isn't a Power 5 conference. Yes, exactly. I agree with that. Because <laughs> the, the SEC is about as good as whatever conference uh, Gonzaga is in. We're in complete agreement. As far as I'm concerned, you can only win Coach of the Year if you coach in the ACC, the Big 12, the Big 10, the Pac whatever. I'm not even sure how many teams are in that conference now. Pac 11. Um, or the or the Big East. Are we agreed? Yeah, I'm with that. that, that okay, that's fine. Well, you could you could also win it in the American, right? No, no, never mind. No, no, just the Big East, not the American. I'm the Big East, not the American. No, where, where where are you going? No, no, no the American's terrible. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my parting shot. I I wanted to show some love. Uh, I went back to campus uh, this past weekend uh, with one of my best friends, and I actually wanted to show some love to this year's headline monitors, Steve Brenner and Delaney King. Um, we talked last week about black tanning and the, and the big test that, uh, that we took that they gave to students for uh, filling in the slots for black tenting. Well, in getting back to campus this past weekend, I got to spend a little time with both of them uh, and just talk Kayville and life as a headline monitor. And uh, they're two incredibly wonderful people. They're excellent students. And I think they're doing a great job. Um, they have responded well to some of the criticisms that us uh, quote unquote old older uh, alums like to uh, give the new students uh, about attendance, about their creativity. But Saturday was, like I said, at times as loud as I've ever heard Cameron. Um, they the crowd was raucous. The student section was into it uh, the entire game, and even when we were down, they were still coming up with ways to get us back into the game. And and they're very creative. They were on their feet and uh, uh, on their on their toes essentially when it comes to creativity and. I think that they were the force behind uh, the comeback um, that we had in the second half. And the run that we had was spurred in no small part to their uh, leadership. So my party shout has to say thank you to them. It was great meeting you guys and uh, to keep up the great work. And a final hello to our pal and friend of the podcast, Mark Newton. Um, I got to meet him and his daughter briefly after the game. Uh, great guy. And uh, he actually got to... Uh, uh, to meet Grayson Allen and his whole family. Um, his daughter is very, very uh, in, much in love with Grayson Allen, as, as are a lot of people. Um, and they got to uh, make your dream come true in, in, meeting, in meeting Grayson Allen. So, uh, Mark, thanks for, thanks for coming out. Uh, good to meet you, and we'll have you back on soon. Hey, can we mention, can we mention that uh, Grayson Allen, as he walked past the NC State bench, um, sort of got shoved a little bit by one of the guys. I, I think it was Abu um, on NC State, and Allen did nothing, didn't turn, didn't react at all. Um, if it had been the other way around and Alan had been the one doing the shoving, um, we would be, um, uh, you know, it, it would be the lead story on Sports Center for the next six weeks. So, hey, Grayson, thanks for playing it cool, baby. It, it, there you was a couple what? times they did that, and, and it, he played it cool in every single one, I think. I, I, think that, I think that we can only give him credit since he came back from the suspension that he hasn't really gotten himself involved in anything despite the chippiness not being dialed back from opponents. I agree. 
And I think with that, we will that will do it for episode 68 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Um, like Sam said last week, we will be back next week after the two games. Uh, but for now, for Sam and Jason, I'm Donald. We'll check you all soon. And Duke Band, take us out.